In a world questioning the impact of AI on human touch and celebratory moments, this episode explores the positive changes technology brings to the wedding industry. Rather than overshadowing human involvement, AI emerges as a tool enhancing creativity and efficiency for wedding planners and couples alike. Andrea delves into the evolving landscape, discussing the transformative energy of curated gatherings and the responsibility tied to the investments made by clients. Highlighting AI's role as an enhancer, not a replacement, Andrea emphasizes the importance of leveraging technology to create more meaningful experiences. The episode unfolds with insightful quotes addressing the balance between AI and human touch, the value of personal investments, and AI's opportunity for creativity. The episode timeline provides a roadmap for listeners, guiding them through Andrea's journey in the wedding industry, her client base, the industry's current shortcomings, the integration of AI, and her vision for the future. Hi everybody, Maria Romano here, True Love Knots, and talk about True Love Knots and wedding plannings. I have one of the one of the most elite wedding planners in the world. I have to say that, Andrea Ippolito, and she is coming all the way from Las Vegas in my backyard as well. And I wanted to just share, she's going to talk a bit about the actual wedding industry and where it's going and how she got started. But I did a little research. So Andrea, your last name, since I'm Italian too, Ippolito means letting the horses loose. Did you know that? No, what I've heard in the past is that it means a is he, she, or it, and Polito is to clean. So he, she, or it cleans, um, and that it comes from a background of people who were traditionally cleaners. My mother is Bares, and my father is Nabledan. Mm-hmm. And when my father's family came over from Italy, the name was misspelled. And so most of the world has Ippolito with an I. That's and where I was spelling is with an E and uh, my great grandfather thought that in order to stay in the country, in order to be an American, that that was the way it had to be spelled. So generally speaking, if you find an Epolito with an E, um, we can normally do some, you know, tracing and, and connect them back to us. See, and I went in, I, you know what, I have to tell you, cause I love to look at last names and to see how they came about. So obviously, so welcome, kudos to you being here today and sharing with me what I thought was the right way. <laughs> And you just set me right on track, which is fine. I love it. You know what, though? I would I would love to find out that it's connected to something with horses. And now I'm going to kind of deep dive into it because my best friend has horses. And a lot of people in our industry, a lot of wedding planners that I know actually do ride and jump. And there's a lot of kind of equestrian and horse culture in the wedding space. So I'd love to find out that I have like a legitimate claim. Isn't that space. nice? So my maiden name is Lavecchia for all of those out there, which means the old lady. So what can I tell you? <laughs> so I understand. Well, anybody. <laughs> so anyway, welcome, welcome, Andrea. And, you know, I know I've seen you around quite a bit in the wedding industry and we're coming up on a big year, 2024. They're talking about engagements. As a matter of fact, I saw a post on Instagram. You were congratulating somebody, a couple that just got engaged. I don't know if they were a client or a relative, but, you know, how how did you actually get started in this industry? And it's a wonderful industry, but also it's a tough industry. (laughs) Yeah, it is. So my my process to finding this actually came from a place of, I, I think, kind of confusion, sadness, and a little bit of the ugly underbelly of the world. When I was 12, turning 13, my father's cousin was killed very unexpectedly. And his daughter had been in the middle of planning her Sweet 16, which Italians from New York the sweet 16 is like the biggest thing that you will ever do. And it was about six weeks away or so. And the family decided to move forward and to still host this party. And so the day comes and, you know, my sister, my brother, and I are in the back of the car. My mom and dad are in the front talking. And I just kind of off the cuff said, you know, I, I can't believe we're doing this. Like, I can't believe that she's having a party because I couldn't conceive of a 
of a way that you would lose your father, especially in such, you know, an unexpected, tragic way, and that you could still move forward like this. And my father adjusted the rearview mirror and he looked at me and he said, you know, honey, planning this party, going through this process, looking for the place, buying the dress, all of those things, that's the last gift her father ever gave her. It's the last, you know, purely fun, joyous experience that she ever had with him. And it's probably the only thing that's been getting her out of bed. And when bad things happen in, in your life, and they always happen, you need something to look forward to and you need something to look back on. And that's why we're coming together to be with her and be supportive and, and do this for her because, you know, things like this matter. And when we got there and, you know, she was backlit and the curtains opened up and she, she walked into the room and she walked by our table and she smiled. And I didn't have the language and I didn't have the, the understanding. I couldn't verbalize the fact that when you take a group of people that you love and that you care about and you put them in one place and you manipulate the lighting and the food and the music, it can be transformative from an energy perspective. It can change the narrative. It can change your life. It can create joy at a time when there's not. And I didn't have the intellect or the maturity to be able to process it. All I knew is that I too want a party because whatever this feeling is, very selfishly at that age, I want some of it. And so, you know, this is before the internet. This is before all of the things. And so I went home and I got a bunch of wedding magazines and I got a binder and I started planning my own Sweet 16. And I, I mean, I carried it with me everywhere. I was sketching dresses and centerpieces and, and, you know, the songs that I wanted played and who I wanted there. And I was constantly updating my list. And I was at a friend's house one day and his mom said, you know, what is this thing that you're carrying around? And she took it and she flipped through it and she handed it back to me. And she said, you're going to be a wedding planner. And I laughed. I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to be a criminal lawyer. And she said, no, you're not. You're going to be a wedding planner. And she owned a limousine company that participated in, you know, a, a mock trade show every weekend, a bunch of vendors would go and they would put up their information, but because it was the weekend, they needed somebody to run the door, somebody to welcome people in, somebody to show the, the couples around, ask questions, get their information. And so she gave me a job. And the first day that I was there, people were coming in and asking, you know, how many people does this limo see? And I was like, I don't. I don't know. And, you know, what's the name of that rose that's kind of gray, but kind of purple. And it's in that movie. And I was like, I, I don't know. Like everything was, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I felt like an idiot. I was sure that I was going to be fired. And when I had downtime, I read all the, the magazines and that was all it took from that moment on. I was hooked. I told my parents, I, I don't think I want to go into law. I think I want to be a wedding planner, which, you know, in, the early 90s wasn't a job. I mean, 89, 91, mm -hmm. That's people right. didn't know what that was. And even when I came out to UNLV and I started um, college, 1995, you know, they make you sit with your counselor and they, the guy said to me, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you come into school for? And I said, I want to be a wedding planner. And he said, oh, I'll put you in catering. And I said, no, 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 I, I don't want to be in catering. I want to be a wedding planner. And I got this like glazed over. He goes, oh, honey, that's that's not a job. And I said, I, I know it's not really popular right now, but there's this woman, Marcy, and she's doing Get Back East. And I see it in the society. Like, I think it's going to be a thing. And so they put me in catering because there was no place to go. And education still, as much as we've done, and as much as I think like what you're doing on the podcast is fantastic, what other people are doing is so great that we're taking the lead ourselves because there's very little in terms of codified education for people who wanna do what we do. And that's because as creatives, we are artists and you can't quantify art and you can't teach vision and you can give people a foundational understanding and you can absolutely teach them business. But the way that you see the world and the world that you wanna live in 
your ability to see a world that doesn't exist yet and then will it to kind of come forward, that you can't teach at you know any college. But what we can do is we can come together and, and we can do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer working and we can influence each other. And I think that that's what's really important and that's what's helping to move us forward right now. And you know, you're so right. And it, it's interesting because when you go back and reflect on, you know, in 1995, I could just imagine the look <laughs> on the counselor's face, like no such thing, right? And how it's changed. We've evolved. Obviously, you should go back to him and said, see what I've done today. It's almost like that <laughs> that movie, Pretty Woman. I went shopping. Oh. So, <laughs> yes, big mistake. Big mistake. I think the, the thing is, is that I still get people I still get students from UNLV and from other colleges that call me all the time that say, I have to do an internship and I really want to be a wedding planner, or I really want to do social planning or event design. And the schools still don't teach it. They teach trade show marketing. They teach it from a hotel perspective, but there's, I mean, you've got the Tezos and you've got the more independent standalone places, whether it's ABC, where you can get a certificate but there's very little in terms of organized education where you can go to a school and leave and say, I have a degree in wedding planning. I have a degree in event design. I have the tools needed and you can get all sorts of certification, but I don't think that there's a place or a team that's really pulled the thread in a way that gives you a level of national exposure and respect and accreditation. And like I said, tons of places that give you certificates, but I, I think there's a part of our industry that lags behind, but I also appreciate it because I think that we're gonna start trying to codify and legislate and manage artists. And I don't know that that's the smartest thing that we can do. Well, it's interesting you say that because I teach a course how to officiate weddings and you're right. It's not even recognized at this point in time, but that's okay. You know, someday a lot of things are going to definitely be on the map and look at what's happened today, which we'll get into your latest book, AI for Wedding Professionals, which I thought was great. But, you know, would you say that when you started, who was your first, let's back up for a second. Who was your first, would you, big wedding that you did? Not necessarily somebody that's well known because they can still have a lot of money in order and still have a great wedding ceremony and you planned it for them. So most of my clients are not international recognized celebrity. It's not what I traffic in. I do really work very well with high net worth individuals that, you know, are nine and 10 figure net worth, but that are under the radar. Mm -hmm. that work really hard, that are incredibly smart, that have done things that impact us all on a daily basis, but that aren't on the cover of a magazine. I have I, that world in terms of tech, lawyers, entrepreneurs. And then the other side that I work with quite a bit is actually athletes. Mm -hmm. And so I can't necessarily give you a name. Oh, no, not a name, but your first one. How did you feel when you got that? <laughs> I, I think that I have felt so excited every time I've, I've gotten a client and there's been a progression, you know, um, I went to the Whippa Gala at recently here in Las Vegas and was chatting with a bunch of other wedding planners. And sometimes I think there is the impression of either overnight success or, well, you were lucky because you started in luxury. You started with clients who had three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a head to spend and really nobody starts there. It's, it's definitively a, a progression. I was, I started as my first wedding job. When I got here, I was 17 and I thought I was coming to the wedding capital of the world and I'm going to go and I'm going to be able to work and do these things. And it's going to be like Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack in Maryland. And instead it was 99 cent buffets and <laughs> cheap room cocktail and drive throughs And I was like, that this, this is not where I thought I was going. Um, and I couldn't get a job because I was 17 and I had never worked in any real capacity. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll get a job being a hostess at a restaurant that has a private room and I'll offer to do the setup and the teardown. 
and then I'll be a hostess that has a lot of volume and I'll learn how quickly a kitchen can put out meals. And then I'll go to a florist and I'll offer to volunteer to clean the shop so that I can understand the names of flowers and the seasonality. So I kept building until I ultimately was able to open the Bellagio in 1998. I was 21 years old. And from there, I went into catering at the Venetian and opened phase 1A and out to Lake Las Vegas. And I just kept building on my skill set and on my history. I was very fortunate to work with incredible people and incredible clients, specifically at Bellagio. And then when I went to the Venetian, I worked for a gentleman by the name of Gary McCreary, who recently retired after more than 20 years. And I got there and because of constraint, there, there wasn't an office. And so Gary took me in and it was really like, you know, serving at the feet of the master. He, he was our associate director at the time and let me share his office and just hearing him speak and understanding the way that he wrote and the incredible importance of being very detailed and communicating and managing up and down and laterally. It, I was so impressionable at that point and I was just desperate for somebody to teach me. And over the years, I just kind of kept collecting those experiences. And the first time that a, a client called me, I mean, I opened up my business. I didn't know what to do. I was like, well, I guess I'll put an ad on the knot. And that night somebody called me and they wanted to do an elopement. And I thought, well, that's not really what I, like, that wasn't the dream, <laughs> but let me see. Cause like the phone rang, so I'm going to answer it. And they wanted to do a really luxury high-end elopement that was going to be, you know, over $30,000, which, wow. you know, in 2011, when micro weddings and all of these things weren't yet a thing, like the ability to like, oh my God, I'm going to have an entire wedding budget for two people. That was the most incredible feeling because the minute that they signed that contract and gave me a check, I felt validated and I felt real. And I felt like, well, now I'm actually a professional wedding planner because this morning when I turned on the website, I was, I was hopeful and I was a hobbyist and I didn't know what I was walking into. And now I'm, I'm a legitimate person who's, who's made money. And I've never taken any of that for granted. People make such tremendous investments in me, whether it's an investment of trust an investment of energy and obviously an investment of money. And I know how lucky I am and how fortunate I am and what a tremendous responsibility is. So every one of them excites me, but yeah, the bigger budget ones, you're kind of like, Ooh, yay. Cause now I get to play. Now I get to do the thing that I love to do because I have the tool that allows me to do it. And that's really all the money is, is a tool that allows me to go to a different place with the work. And it's incredible because I've seen it and I follow it all over Instagram. By the way, I have to, I told you, I think yesterday too, one of the chapels I work out of, Curtis Shannon, is just a big fan of yours. And he oh. said, he said to me, Maria, I buy every book. Every oh. time I go to the wedding show, he just loves, loves your work, which I is know great. Curtis is. Tell him I said hi. You do know him. Okay. I do. Yes. Yes. So yes. that's, I will right. tell him. But, you know, let's take a moment and talk about the wedding industry moving forward. Uh, I had done an interview with Megan Ely a few months ago and I asked her, where do you see the, you know, Megan, where do you see the industry going? She says, you know, we need to definitely get more in touch with technology. And then of course you wrote the books. Tell me we are lacking in some places, aren't we? I don't, I, I'm going to say lacking is difficult and there's, there's such a spread. So I, there's a book that I've published called AI for Wedding Professionals mm -hmm. that I prompted ChatGPT to write. So if you actually read the book, the first, the first part of it, the introduction, is the only part that I wrote freehand. And it started out because every time I spoke to somebody in the industry, another professional, another colleague, and I would talk to them about AI, with the exception of a very small think tank mm -hmm. that I'm a part of. People were like, absolutely not. We don't want to touch AI. It's not going to be a thing. It's not going to be real. We don't need this in our industry. And I was like, but you said today, you sound like people did about the internet in the eighties and nineties. Like it's going to be a fad. It's going to go away. 
AI is here and it's not going to go away and it's moving very, very fast. And if you ignore it, you're very, very quickly going to be brushed aside. And if you think that AI can take your job, then it will. But the reality is, AI isn't going to take your job. Somebody who knows how to leverage AI mm -hmm. is going to take your job. And so I wanted to show what the capabilities, even in its infancy, what could AI do? And so I started asking, I was like, what better way to learn than to be taught by the machine itself? And so I asked chat, each, you know, chat GPT, what do you believe the wedding industry needs to know? about AI? What do you think a creative artist needs to know? What do you think a creative entrepreneur needs to know? And AI spit it out. And I said, okay, well, if I was going to write a book about AI for the wedding industry, what chapters do you think would be the most impactful? And it told me. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, can you write me the first chapter? And then I read it and I edited it a little bit. And I said, okay, now in the second chapter, can you write it in my tone? Because I learned very much the way that you would train an employee to do things you want them to do in the way you want them to do it by asking better questions and by giving AI better information, you can turn it into, we're not quite there where it can duplicate me. I'm not going to be able to clone myself yet, but I wrote, I, I prompted AI to write that book in an afternoon. And so the entire book is AI teaching you about AI being prompted by me to ask better questions. And it was such an interesting use of the technology. And what really, what it, because when I went back and I reread it, I was like, I'm not going to edit it. I'm not going to change it. I'm going to add my intro and my ex, my outro and my kind of, you know, wrap up. But I want people to, to see two things. Number one, the information in it is fantastic. What it can do, how you can use AI to track weather, how you can use AI to create 3D renderings, how you can use AI to, you know, be more expedient with writing emails and tech, all of those things, great information. But what's missing from AI for wedding planners and that is so evident in leggings aren't pants and redefine your wedding industry is the humanity, the times yes. where I make a mistake, the times where I trip over a word, the time where the sentence structure sounds like me. And when you read it, you can read it in my voice, but it's not perfect. And that's why AI is never going to replace us, especially as artists, because AI can get you 90% there and it can be pristine. But that 10% is the human ability to see each other and connect with each other and process things emotionally and to deliver it in a way that is slightly flawed. And that's the piece that makes the work beautiful. That's the thing that makes the work interesting because I've seen a million pretty, pretty girls that are uninteresting. But there are some women that are just captivating and, and they're not perfect, but there's something about them. And I think it's the same th thing when it comes to AI versus what we're doing. AI will get you a perfect specimen to the extent that you allow it to, to the extent that you tell it to, but it has not, and it will never take the place of our humanity. What AI will do is it will knock out the middle because the at the middle of the industry, 80, 90% is good enough because in the middle of the industry, a lot of times you're paying to maybe get 80% of the way there. You're paying to get 70% of the way there. You hope to get right on the cusp. And so AI will be able to do that quicker, faster, better than any other human professional in the industry the real entry level will never use it because they won't have a need to. And what's going to really expand the gap between the middle and even entry level luxury, and then a true kind of high level ultra lux couture space is going to be that 15% that 
that AI just can't close because it doesn't see the world through our eyes. That is so true. But I do see where it's very helpful for our industry. I know just in my industry, I can help write a love story, right? Get the love story crafted, keep it under so many words and just pop it in and it's done. And it's crafted in a way that there are areas and ideas that I never even thought of when I think about writing someone's love story. So definitely, I think writing vows is definitely a way to go in on my side and your side and social media content. It can oh, give you yeah. a whole social media calendar. So I, I think it's definitely, I've been using it. I love it. It saves me. So I. And I think that something that people who, people who maybe saw it and like dabbled and didn't really know what they were looking at at first. I try to spend 10 to 15 minutes on AI at minimum a day because I just like going to the gym or anything else or cooking. It's muscle memory. The right. more you use it, the more comfortable you get using it, the better and more proficient you become. But right now in chat GPT, you can take a photo and you can pull it into chat GPT and you can say, I need a caption for Instagram that's going to talk about the flowers. I need a caption for Instagram that's going to talk about, you know, the lighting. I need a caption that I, I'm trying to attract this client. And ChatGPT will give you four or five different ideas of how you can verbal that. Now, Instagram specifically and social media is my opportunity to personally, without any hindrance, speak directly to my ideal client. And so I don't use it to write my captions. I don't use it to write my scripts. But what I do use it for is for SEOing my website. I use it for when I'm trying to write a blog and I'm, I'm stuck. I'll take what I've written so far and I'll say, finish this or give me two more sentences. And it, it is helpful in that it removes the roadblocks and it just pushes them to the side. You can do so many things. And, you know, I, I am not an efficient can't like I, that is not what I do, but I'm legally ordained mm -hmm. and I have done two ceremonies for uh, couples that I was incredibly close with that were very, very generous in inviting me in to do that for them. And I had them both run their vows separately through AI just to elevate it mm -hmm. a little bit. You can use it to write menus. You can use it to track food pricing if you're in catering. You can use it to look at, you know, futures, everything that any question that you have about our industry, I have a bride using it right now to kind of, you know, guide her in designing the, the rough sketches of the ideal wedding gown that she has. And she's pulling different pictures in and having AI help her understand. Now, ultimately the dress will be finished by an artist, but to be able to come to, to somebody like me and say, I have 80% and now I get to use my best effort, my best energy, my creativity, in really focusing on that 20% that pushes the experience to a whole new place, that allows us to ramp up hard and fast. And it's so important because I think that a lot of times, especially if we're small business owners, especially if we're solopreneurs, we get dragged down into the minutia of every single day working within the business answering emails that AI can help us address, responding to text messages, scheduling. I mean, I for the first time ever, I have AI helping to manage my schedule. And it's scary at first, but you do it a few times and you understand that you can trust the tech to do this for you. And now I'm much more hands off. And so if I don't need to think about where am I going? Who am I talking to? What do I need to do? And I just let it prompt me. I have all this extra space and energy that I can put into the places that make me really, really good at what I do. And that you hit the nail right on the head because what AI is doing for us, not just our industry, multiple industries, is giving us the opportunity 
to spend more time to be creative, to spend more time with the people we love, you know, whatever it is. So speaking of which, I want to be mindful of your time. So over the next two years, what's your forecast in the wedding industry? I think we're going to see a larger gap. So, um, you know, when you, a lot of people ask me to talk about design trends, but I love this because I think this is what you're asking is about a business trend. We are going to see people get more educated. We're going to see individual businesses, specifically venues, get better at servicing their clients in a way that is possibly going to be injurious to partners. My husband has a venue management company. And so one of the things that they've been able to do is they're able to respond faster. They're able to match you easier with a photographer. They're able to give you a better script for your video. They're able to automatically put together designs and all of these extra little pieces and the nuances of what they're going to be able to do you're going to find that people who specialize in the middle are going to become less and less important because the universe and the world and technology is going to be able to give the middle such an immediate, quick access to the things that a human normally would. So I think that you're going to see people really need to get more educated. I think you're going to see a lot of independent solo small businesses are going to want to connect with each other in a more meaningful codified way because rather and this is the hope actually because it could go the other way people could cannibalize off each other and i think we've seen what happens when we do that to one another i think instead you're going to see people forming much stronger partnerships so that they can and this is specifically in the middle that they will be able to offer more insight, more education, more impact, and that they'll be able to spend somebody's money in a more meaningful way because they'll have a deeper level of connection that's gonna let them do that. Now, separately on the Lux and Ultra Lux side, as people who came through a pandemic, at people with a very short attention span, and we forget what that was like very, very quickly. But what has become intrinsic to us is that the next day, the next experience, the next time that we all get to be together is no longer guaranteed. And so people who really want experiences are going to be making bigger investments. They're going to be making deeper investments where every single piece that goes into an experience is going to mean so much more because it's not just about throwing a pretty party. It's about telling a story. It's about rewarding the careful observer, people who come in and pick something up and say, oh, the couple that I congratulated, they're actually new clients. Only Michaela and Brandon would have done this because we know them so well. And so you're going to see people who are working with an elite type of client are going to need to grow deeper and spend more time getting to know people because it's going to be so important that we deliver them no more, nothing that even feels cookie cutter, but I think you're going to see a lot of diversity in terms of design, in terms of experiences, and in terms of the way that we move people through an experience because it's not just about cranking out enough work. It's about really doing better work. Well, wow. That was very insightful. Definitely. You got to have me thinking I'm going to, when I go back and we put actually <laughs> produce this and put this out on social media, I'm going to listen to this and send it out to my sure. email list as well. No, and I think you're right. And I think that's what, what it's all about. It's all about leveling up the experience <laughs> and everything we're doing. And you know what? It starts with you. It starts with you at home. And I know that you yourself personally, you probably give your, your family the best experience from morning till night. And I think that's important starting there so that you can bring that into your professional workspace as well. Just yeah, I mean, things I, you do. My kids from a very early age were like, we don't want parties. And I was like, oh, thank you. Thank goodness. They, they, my kids want trips, they want experiences. And 
what I can tell you is that you can't sell luxury. You can't connect to luxury and you, you certainly can't service it unless you've had the opportunity to experience it a little bit in your own life. And I decided that I was, I wanted to show up as the highest version of myself, not necessarily at the time for myself, but really for my kids. I wanted to give my son an idea of what you should be looking for. I wanted to give my daughter something to aspire to. And I wanted to be the kind of woman that my husband would really love coming home to and, and would love being with. And I thought, you know, all of these times we're constantly thinking to ourselves, like, someday I'm going to live like this. Someday I'm going to be the person that gets up every day and does my own hair and makeup. Someday I'm going to be someone who wears my jewelry just because. And when you live your life in a someday sort of way, because today is never quite your style, you miss it. And every day is a special occasion and every day can be celebrated. And the fact of the matter is, is that you can live in a set in a state of luxury and joy and enjoyment every single day if you just make a little bit of an effort and it becomes habitual and it becomes a way of you know I've, I've decorated my house in a way that makes me feel good I've gotten dressed in a way that makes me feel good I put on my makeup and I do my hair and I cook a good meal and when you're used to being treated to those kinds of experiences you don't need to go and spend a thousand dollars eating at Carbone. You can go sit at the bar and order an appetizer and a glass of wine and understand the quality and the food and what it feels to hold a stemware and how the music impacts you and the way that the bartender serves you. You don't need to buy a $12,000 Chanel bag. You can go in and you can experience that level of service by buying a lipstick or by buying a keychain or by just window shopping and you can connect to a place of these are the best things that life has to offer no matter what your current economic state is and just by doing that it will become part of the fiber of your life and that will allow you to communicate its true value to your clients because it's never about the stuff and it's always about how the stuff makes us feel and if we have an opportunity to feel that it becomes that much easier to create that feeling for other people. And I love that. I love just, I love the way you definitely shared that your inspiration on how we can experience luxury without necessarily having, you know, a large bank account to do so. By the way, I love Carbone's meatballs and I do oh. like sitting at the bar. So I think that's the best place to start. <laughs> meatballs are so good. And as an Italian who cooks dinner, you know, six <laughs> nights a week, those meatballs are so good. And good for they're, they're six spicy. nights a week. Did you hear that? Everybody, she actually cooks. She says six nights a week. Okay. I try to. Unless I'm on the road, my kids know that like I cook for dinner and everybody sits and everybody <laughs> eats. And that's that's the old school Italian in me. And uh I, I think that as they get older, they're gonna appreciate it. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I can't oh, wait to share this with, with with everyone and everybody out there. Coming up to the holidays, enjoy the holidays with each other. You know, just accept each other for who they are. Have fun. Go out and live life. And remember to spread love. Always. Thank you so much. <laughs>